Remember, last week I pointed out that 16 and 17 are parallels to verse 18. If you'll remember, I said that, remember I said that when Paul was talking in verses 16 and 17, and he used the phrase, for therein is the righteousness revealed, therein is the righteousness of God, he parallels that very phrase with this phrase in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. The gospel is revealed, the power of God unto salvation is revealed, and if you'll remember, I mentioned that that power, that revelation was seen. It wasn't only revealed in the preaching of the gospel, which it is. The power of God to salvation comes through the preaching of the gospel, but that preaching of the gospel is the verbal account of what was actually manifested in reality, and that is the living gospel, Jesus Christ, and his resurrection from the dead. So Paul wants to make this parallel. You saw that power. You heard that power spoken of in the gospel. That same revelation of that power to salvation is now a revelation of God's wrath coming directly from heaven. You read this passage, and we often misunderstand the force of this section. We look at this and we say, oh, the apostle is uh, he's dour, he's bitter. Uh, this is a depressing individual who hated mankind. And they always cite this as one of their proof texts. But unfortunately, that misses the point. Paul isn't condemning mankind. Paul is telling the world this is what each and every one of us is like in some way because the gospel reveals our fallen nature and it is the gospel that condemns mankind. Paul is the messenger of the gospel and it is that very gospel, that very power of God unto salvation, the very revelation of the righteousness of Christ which reveals the sinfulness of man. There is the juxtaposition. Well, let's look at this revelation. Verses 18 through 20. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. It is disclosed to the world. This wrath is made manifest. And I want you to keep that in mind because that sets up the rest of this section. What Paul is saying, he's saying God's wrath is revealed. You see it. You experience it. And in a minute, I'm going to show you how God's wrath is manifested. He says that nature reveals the divine Godhead. Maybe not in every detail of how we understand who the personal God is, but certainly in his power and in his glory. To see nature, then, according to Paul, is to know there is a God. Obedience to God involves the recognition that all that there is in creation comes from God. That nature is a witness to the divine Godhead. To disobey God is to violate, it is to act in opposition to, it is to go against the very nature, the natural order in which we live, and he created. Nature. The physical world is perfectly sufficient to reveal that God exists. 
There's no excuse. Nature makes it clear that to reject God is inexcusable. Recently, Richard Dawkins, everybody knows Richard Dawkins, that wonderful big-mouthed atheist who thinks he knows more than everybody else in the universe, was asked in an interview in the BBC, Professor Dawkins, if you get to heaven and you stand before the throne of God and God, and God asks you, why didn't you believe, what are you going to say? And Professor Dawkins like the truly original thinker that he is, quoted Bertrand Russell. And he said, not enough evidence, Lord. Well, I dare say Russell now knows the mistake of that statement. And Dawkins is going to make, uh, Dawkins is going to be confronted with the error of that judgment. Because you know what God's response to Richard Dawkins is going to be? He's going to do this. Look. And then he's going to hand him the Psalter. And he's going to say, Richard, you grew up an Anglican. Turn to Psalm 19, verse 1. Read that for me, will you, Richard? And Richard's going to read these words. The heavens declare, they speak, they preach, they scream, they shout, they make manifest the glory of God. And the firmament shows his handiwork. So Richard, can I have the Psalter back? Because in hell you're not entitled to it. You don't have an excuse. There was more than enough evidence, and even if it was only nature, if it was only the sky that you saw and the stars in the heavens, you should have fallen on your face. How many times do we hear them praise the wonder of, this, of the universe? Look at how beautiful that is. And every time they utter one of those appellations, they heap judgment on themselves if they do not acknowledge that it was created by God. But you know what? The situation is even worse than that. Because not only is God's wrath revealed from heaven, not only is God sitting on the throne, and in the way that he dispenses his power to salvation, he dispenses his wrath from his throne, not only did he make it manifest to all people that he exists, not only is that manifestation in nature an indictment that leaves them without an excuse, it is because of that very manifestation, it is because of that revelation of God in nature that they reject him. Nature and its existence is the reason, one of the reasons, that fallen man rejects God's existence. Look at verse 21. So they are without excuse. Why are they without excuse? Because of that, when they knew God, knew, gnosis, you've heard me talk about it in, when we're dealing with the creed, knowledge, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain, empty, worthless in their imaginations, and their heart was darkened. The argument against God's existence is not an intellectual argument, brethren. The argument against God is a moral one. They look at nature and they don't want to submit. They don't want to be under the authority of a divine God. I'm doing my doctoral work in Dr. Cornelius Van Til and his method of defending Christianity. Now, I don't agree with Dr. Van Til on every point. As a matter of fact, I've spent 30 years finding mistakes in his position. But one of the things Dr. Van Til said that is truer than anything I have ever read anywhere about anything 
is the autonomy of man is what sets him off as the enemy of God. Romans chapter 1 tells us very clearly everything in our existence points to God's existence and it is man's sinful nature, his desire to be his own boss, his own law, not to submit to anything or anyone else that makes him the enemy of God. And in that, Dr. Van Til was 100% correct. And note what Paul says, and we'll get to this as the transition into verses 22 through 27. They glorified him not as God. Remember what I had told you about God's glory. Remember I told you and I preached about the glory cloud and the manifestation of who God is comes through his glory. We hear the Shekinah glory. We see the glory cloud defend on the tabernacle. We see the glory fire. We see Christ's transfiguration and the revelation of his glory as God. We see in God's glory the expression of who he is. We see that part of that expression is the manifestation of his creation by showing his power in nature and they change that. destroy that. They refuse to acknowledge that glory. And professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged, they turned one thing into something else. They changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Don't ever think, don't ever think evolution began with Charles Darwin. Evolution has existed since the Garden of Eden. One of the most prominent expressions of evolution came in Heraclitus, one of the pre-Socratics. It's been around that long. We read this and we think, oh my gosh, Paul's looking into the future and seeing Darwin's evolution. Paul was dealing with this in his own day. Beloved, this right now, in which we exist today with this whole nonsense about evolution is the foot of Mount Sinai all over again. This is Exodus 19. This is the manifestation of God's glory in nature. And these are the errands of the day taking what God has created, turning it into their own gods, and saying, this is what you need to worship. This is modern day idolatry. Don't think pagans lived 2,000 years ago. Your next door neighbor is a pagan. If he's not a believer. Or she. And I want you to notice what happens. You want to change? You want to exchange? You want to take God's glory and you want to make it something else? Verse 24, God gave them up. Paradokin, here, here you go. You want to know what it means to see God's wrath in action? And here's one of the examples where he turns around and he withdraws himself. He, he withdraws the restraining power of the Holy Spirit and he says, you want to run around like pigs in slop? You want to eat less than what the goats and the animals eat? You want to function like a dog following your own vomit? 
Knock yourselves out. Take me out of the schools. Remove me from the courthouses. Take me out of the hospitals. If that's what you want, you got it. But don't you dare come complaining to me when your children are dying. Don't complain to me when a hurricane rips through your town and people suffer. You don't want me. You want four-footed beasts. You want birds. You want to be a law unto yourself. Well, go ahead, figure it out for yourself. And if that's not enough, they did it to dishonor their own bodies. They changed the truth of God into a lie. It's not God's nature out here. It's all these little animals out here. That's the truth. You're nothing but a walking, talking panda bear. That's all you are. You're a very, very articulate piece of filet mignon. Is it any wonder Belgium just passed the law saying that we can euthanize children now? Think we're far behind? So God gave them up to vile affections. He gave them, he gave up the women who changed the natural use into that which is against nature, against his revelation of himself in the world. And likewise men, leaving the natural use of women and burning in their lust towards one another. Men and as delicately as the King James ever puts anything with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat, which was meat which was appropriate you're an alcoholic and you live your life as an alcoholic you become a Christian does that mean that the consequences of your actions have been removed you still may wind up with cirrhosis of the liver. You're a drug addict, and you share needles with others. If you become a Christian, does that mean that the hepatitis you got from those needles suddenly disappears? Sins carry with them consequences. Do you think AIDS is just an accident? is what happens when you have sex with animals. You know, that's where AIDS came from, right? It comes from either Africa or Haiti. They have a narrow, I think they narrowed it down to Africa because people were having sex with monkeys. Your actions, the sins you commit have consequences in and of themselves. You want to change the natural for the unnatural? Don't come complaining to me when the consequences of your actions manifest themselves, God says. And he turns them over. And then at the end of the, the, end of the chapter, verses 28 through 32, and even, and even with all of this, as they did not retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over, and this is a different verb that Paul uses. And notice, as I've spoken this morning, notice the tenses of the verbs. Change, exchanged, gave. These are all past tense. In Greek, it's the aorist. One time, that's it. It happened, there you go gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient with the right way. Convenio. Not the right way to go. You go through the various translations. It says reprobate, debased, depraved, 
But the verb that Paul uses means rejected. It means unapproved. God gave them to do things that he did not approve of, that he rejected. And he rejects them. And listen to the litany. And this is not an exhaustive litany in which Paul engages. These are just manifestations of unrighteousness and ungodliness. Fornication. Can you turn the television on? Can you look at an advertisement where sex isn't the means by which we promote our merchandise? And the ironic twist to this is that one of the primary marketing avenues today that doesn't use fornication or sex, primarily, is Budweiser. Look at the commercial that they had at the Super Bowl. That was one of the sweetest commercials you'll ever see. And they're selling alcohol. Wickedness, covetousness. You think, we, you think that Paul is talking about something special here? You think that we don't see covetousness today? Really? What do you think Obamacare is? Oh, I don't have something, so I want what you have. No, I'm not going to have I'm not going to pay for it. I'm not going to be responsible. I'm just going to take what you have. What do you think socialism is? Oh, you have money and I don't? Oh, you've got to give me some of that. I'm sorry my New York comes out when I get irritated. Income inequality? Get off your butt and get a job. Oh, there are no jobs? Well, maybe you should elect people that can create jobs. Because scripture says the man that doesn't work doesn't eat. It doesn't say the man doesn't, that doesn't work should be living off the man that does work. That's not to say that there's not a place for mercy and assistance. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a culture that says, I'm going to take what you have because I want it. Maliciousness. You think we don't live in a world of maliciousness? I'm going to read some references. I'm just going to read some passages. I want to show you how bad it is. And people don't even realize how bad it is. Sarah Silverman, Bill Maher. And ye shall not swear by my name falsely, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, you're going to say something that God, that, that you claim God says, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people, because he had given his seed unto Molech, child sacrifice, to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. Neither shall ye profane my holy name, but I will be hallowed among the children of Israel. I am the Lord your God, which hallows you. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, no, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. Do you hear people taking the Lord's name in vain? Do you hear people mocking, maliciously slandering God in public? Do you think God's wrath is not being revealed? from heaven against these people that do that. I only half jokingly slide away from people when they do that. That is something that I fear more than anything else when people do that. I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have no other gods but me. Thou shalt not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. What is the first thing that Jesus teaches us 
in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. And these people spit on it? Full of envy, murder. Oh, do we need to talk about murder? We live in a culture, we live in a culture that can be described in one word, Molech. Now I understand for anybody that winds up hearing this, Molech dealt with adult, you know, not adult children, but infant children that were born. But the principle is the same. Firstborn children were executed. See, but we, we're so sophisticated and we're so advanced in our culture that we don't have to wait for the firstborn and we don't even have to wait for them to be born. We can kill them in the womb. We can kill them before they're born. And just to prove it, we do a million and a half a year. And now we have Belgium to anticipate in this country. And don't think that that hasn't been discussed in this country. 30 years ago, I sat in in one of my graduate classes in philosophy and listened to a man named Tristram, I can't, I can never pronounce his name, E. Tristram Engelhart, who used to teach, I don't know if he still teaches, he used to teach medical ethics and philosophy at Baylor University, and he said that only persons have the right to live and the definition of a person is someone that can cognitive, I heard, this is, this is how much of an impact it made on me. I'm gonna quote you, 30 years ago I heard this. Only persons who can cognitively interact socially are persons. Think about that for one minute. Cognitively interact socially. How many children do you know cog that can cognitively socially interact? that they even know that they're social. Unless you think it was only 30 years ago, I challenge you, I encourage you, read any of the works of Pete Singer from Princeton University today. He says the same thing. I think he cuts it off at six years old though. He's gracious. Do you think the culture we live in is any superior to what Paul was talking about? Paul's talking about us today. Verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, even the whack jobs got it right when they say God's going to judge people for this behavior. That they which commit such things are worthy of death, okay, they know they're going to die, they know they should be judged. Not only do they the same things, but they have pleasure in them that do them. You think this was just a first century idea? The New Revised Standard translates that, for that phrase, yet they not only do them but even applaud others who practice them. The new the NIV says they not only continue to do these things, but also approve of those who practice these things. The New American Standard says, but also give hearty approval who practice them. And the authorized standard version says, but also consent with them that practice them. You think that was just for the first century? You know who Ellen Page is? You see the, you see Jude, the movie Juno? X-Men? Cute little 26 year old actress? Came out Friday. I'm gay. I'm doing this to be vocal. I have to stand up for what I believe and support the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, animal humping crowd or whatever. You want to hear what Hollywood said? I'm not going to name the names of the actors because some of you may like some of these people. 
I can't stand these people. I don't care how talented they are. Ellen Page, you are my hero. Articulate, untethered, full of love for you. Never have you been more beautiful. That was a woman. Bravo, Ellen Page. Be who you are, and the world will be a better place. Love thyself. It was a man. Another couple of women, flabbergasted by the eloquent, inspiring words of Ellen Page. Thanks to her for being true, and somebody else, I don't know what HRC is, maybe you know what it is, for being true agents of change. Love is love. Here's a rocket scientist for you. And then the last one, and this is the one that I, fortunately my wife was shopping because I screamed when I heard this one. Four words. You are so brave. She's brave? She's brave. Coming out in an environment that coddles and embraces homosexuality, she's brave. In a country that's going to, in a swell, pass laws for same-sex marriage, she's brave? You want to see brave? Go talk to Phil Robertson. And I don't even agree with Phil Robertson. Duck Dynasty, and he was quoting, albeit in a paraphrased manner, he was quoting scripture, 1 Corinthians 6. And what did they say about him? Hate speech. He's a bigot. Do you realize what they're telling you, my friend? God's word is hate speech. Realize it. You want to be brave? I dare you to quote Romans to someone. I dare you to stand up for biblical principles. Stand up for the cross. Tell someone homosexuality is a sin. And you watch what happens. Go to an abortion clinic and just stand out front. Don't even say anything. Just stand there. Brave? She was brave? Please, she'll be brave when I see her standing before God and then telling God she's gay. And here's the thing. The verb Paul uses is a compound verb. It comes from, it comes from the Greek verb eudokao, which basically means to be pleased with to take pleasure in. And this is a compound verb. This, he compounds it to intensify the meaning and he combines it with the preposition and it means to be pleased all together with, to approve together with. In other words, I'm joining in with you. I told you this was gonna be difficult. At least you can say I didn't lie. But this is the truth. The gospel of God is revealed and it is the power of salvation for it is the righteousness of God in the act of, obe the act of obedience of Christ. Christ faced every one of the things that I just mentioned to you in Romans chapter 1 and he lived and conquered it. He actively obeyed God. He actively rejected those things. And that's the righteousness that God gives us in Christ. That righteousness. But that righteousness shines a light on everything else that doesn't fall within its sphere. And that's the rest of Romans chapter 1. And that is the wrath that God reveals. A.W. Pink once said many, 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 many years ago that people think God's an old man, sitting in a wheelchair with a nice long white beard. He doesn't particularly like sin. He doesn't particularly like what people are doing. 
but he doesn't do anything about it, and he just rocks noddingly and winks. And Pink was right. That's what people think God is. Unfortunately, they've never read the Apostle Paul. That's not who God is. God is the God who saves us. God is the God who sends his son for us, and God is the God who judges us. I'm going to read one verse, and I'm going to close with this one verse. And I want you to listen very carefully because it sums up that first chapter of Romans. Psalm 92, 7. That when the wicked sprouted up like grass, and boy, are we living in a field right now, and all who did iniquity flourished. It was only then, and it was only that they might be destroyed forever. Don't ever think God turns a blind eye to sin and disobedience. You avail yourself of Christ's grace here. And every time we participate in the Eucharist, and every time we consecrate this sacrament, we are indicting the world. We are preaching Romans chapter 